Hey everyone, Jason here, founder and co-CEO at MindBuddyGreen and your host of the MindBuddyGreen podcast. And today I'm here to talk about longevity. This conversation on longevity has advanced by leaps and bounds since we founded MindBuddyGreen back in 2009. And while it's great that there are so many evidence-based recommendations on the subject than ever before, it's become overwhelming and impossible to keep up with them all. So much so it can actually add more stress to your life than improvement. This is why my wife and co-founder Colleen and I set out to cut through the noise and answer this question when we began writing our new book over two years ago called The Joy of Well-Being, a practical guide to a happy, healthy, and long life. Practical being the key word here. Now in this book, we've taken 14 years of our insider knowledge, leveraging all we've learned from the best experts in the world and the latest and greatest science and distilled it down just to the most practical info. Essentially, we've done the legwork so you don't have to. We're confident that you can get to 80% of your maximum well-being and help you maximize joy at the same time. And most importantly, if it's in the book, it's got to meet these three criteria. One, it's accessible to everyone. Two, it's science-backed. And three, it offers the possibility of joy. If it doesn't do all those three things and it's not in the book, it's as simple as that. We believe, I believe, and I know you believe that you deserve joyful well-being. So please go to thejoyofwellbeing.com or to Amazon or your favorite book retailer to pre-order your copy today. Thank you so much. I know you are going to love our book with gratitude and joy, Jason. When I'm working with someone who's, who's really trying to build lean muscle, I always remind them it's, you have to hit those protein macros. You have to create enough stimulus. So you have to lift heavy things. And for each one of us, that might look a little different and you have to have high quality sleep and you can't build healthy lean muscle without all three of those. Hey everyone, if you've hit a weight loss plateau, struggle with a lack of energy, or can't overcome unhealthy food cravings, you've come to the right place. When it comes to those concerns, focusing on metabolic health is key. Cynthia Thurlow would agree. As a nurse practitioner for over 10 years, she has always been interested in metabolic health. But it wasn't until she experienced perimenopausal weight loss resistance that she saw just how important it was for her overall well-being. Now she approaches metabolic health from multiple angles. She focuses on quality protein, strength training, sleep, and she practices intermittent fasting. In fact, she's become a globally recognized expert on IF and women's health. In this episode, you'll hear all of Cynthia's functional nutrition tips for sustainable long-term health. I certainly learned a lot from our interview and have a good feeling you will too. Cynthia, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So great to have you on the show. I can't believe it's taken this long, but better late than never. So welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. So you have an interesting background. Can you start a little bit you know, start by talking about your credentials, your background, and your your own personal health journey. Yeah, so I'm a traditionally trained allopathic nurse practitioner. Um, I did all of my training at Johns Hopkins and, you know, went from being an ER nurse to being an adrenaline junkie fueled cardiology nurse practitioner. I did that for 16 years. And probably the last 10 years of that job, I, I just really felt like I kept seeing reoccurring issues with my patients. And it troubled me because the, the answer should never be just more medication, more antihypertensives, more lipid lowering agents, uh, more procedures. And I started to really question how much lifestyle choices played a role in these chronic diseases that I was seeing. And I started articulating this and it wasn't a particularly well received message, you know, for my colleagues. They're like, no, 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 everything we're doing, this is evidence-based care. Um, you know, more, more drug therapy, you know, optimizing drug therapy, you know, hitting those LDL targets, um, you know, sending people for cardiac casts or even bypass surgery. And so, you know, as I started to kind of have this journey and evolution, I have a, uh, my oldest son developed life-threatening food allergies. And that really sent me down a rabbit hole of really looking closely at the food that we were eating and how could this child who's had like the best nutrition and the best of everything 
um, ever develop these life-threatening food allergies. And I read a book by Robin O'Brien called The Unhealthy Truth, and that really changed the trajectory of everything. Because once you see, you can't unsee. And so I started talking more deliberately about um, diet and sleep and stress management and exercise with my patients. And I finally got to a point where, you know, I was doing all this additional training and certifications and really, you know, dove down this rabbit hole of functional medicine, functional nutrition. And I literally got up one morning, looked at my husband and said, I can't do this anymore. And my husband's like, what are you talking about? You know, I'm married to an engineer who's super fiscally conservative. He's like, you've got this well-paying job. What are you talking about? I said, I cannot write another prescription. There has to be a better way. And I can't do the kind of work that I want to do in this existing structure that I'm in, in this traditional allopathic model. And so I took a leap of faith and, um, you know, kind of created my own practice, really focusing on lifestyle medicine. And, you know, from my perspective, um, being able to talk to my patients about intermittent fasting and more protein in their diets, less uh, processed carbohydrates, the value of sleep, the value of exercise and certain types of exercise, the value of optimizing um, all of these lifestyle pieces is really what I'm more excited and passionate to do than anything I've ever found before, secondarily only to being a mom and a wife. Um, so that's that's really how I've gotten to where I am today was really recognizing uh, an untapped need. Um, I had so many patients saying to me that they wanted to spend more time talking about these things, but we couldn't fit that into a 15 minute office visit. And so now I have the opportunity to connect with more people and be able to do it in a way where I'm impacting more lives. And I still love my, you know, traditional allopathic trained providers, and there's certainly a place for that. But this is the really the work that I was meant to be doing. Well, that's amazing. And congratulations. I I'm curious, what allergy did your son have? And when did he develop it? Yeah, so it started with uh, Jack developed uh, really significant eczema when he was four months old and and kind of the traditional pediatrician's recommendations are don't bathe your kid very often and just put them on these high potency topical corticosteroids. That's standard therapy. And I kept saying, you know, this is a kid who's exclusively breastfed. And I kept saying, is it something I'm eating? Is it something I'm eating that's making my son react? And so initially it was just the eczema. And then when we got to a year and it was just, just as bad, and this is another as happy, thriving, hitting every milestone, very active, sleeping well, you know, adorable little guy. And then I really pushed the issue and said, I want to know if he has a food allergy, because we know that this generation of children are growing up with exponential rates of food allergies and food sensitivities. And I knew the statistics. I know that only 30% of children will outgrow a food allergy. So I wanted to know. So we went to the allergist and, you know, the things that I could have imagined he was allergic to weren't even weren't even in the 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 sphere of what we what we thought. Uh, Jack had life threatening uh, peanut and tree nut allergies, and it was so significant that the allergist said, and I'm not exaggerating, when we left her office, carry an EpiPen and pray. What parent wants to hear that from their allergist? Because as someone who is not very fear based and is not someone who's an alarmist. As a clinician, I was like, do we ever get to eat out at restaurants? How can I go to someone's house and for my child to be safe? And the thought of giving my one-year-old an EpiPen, having seen a lot of anaphylactic reactions as an ER nurse and even as an NP, was not something I ever wanted to imagine. And so that then started this kind of trajectory of making every single thing for him and his diet from scratch. And this is really before the advent. I mean, it certainly has been more trending over the past 10 years, but my son will be 18 in August. 18 years ago, 17 years ago, 16 years ago, you didn't see a lot of organic food options. And so before there were baby puri, 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 like baby food makers, I was making everything in my Vitamix and making it for him. And so he didn't know any differently. But sure enough, his eczema resolved over time, but it still left me feeling very concerned about having him eat outside the home because I couldn't control what he was exposed to. And I think for a lot of people listening, unless you've seen what severe food allergies look like or heard stories about what happens when someone's airway closes, it is very frightening. And I don't think, I don't think per se, 
that it's people aren't interested in understanding what your your child's potential reactions could be to said foods, but there's this lack of sensitivity. Like as an example, my husband loves peanut butter, but during those time periods, we kept it like in another room up on a shelf. He never ate it around him, but we were so careful and conscientious. And thankfully he's never needed to have his EpiPen use. We've had some close calls, but it has definitely given me pause as a parent to really understand and appreciate what some families go through. So I'm assuming he's still ultra sensitive to peanuts as of today. He is. And it's interesting. We're in a new city and we saw a new allergist and the allergist offered him the option. You know, he's a teenager. Would you like to be desensitized to peanuts? And so Jack said, well, I'm interested in hearing more about this. And he said, well, this isn't just you get desensitized and it goes away. It's for the rest of your life. And he just said, I don't think that's realistic. I would rather just avoid. And so now we're navigating having a teenager who's dating, you know, it's his first girlfriend and having to have conversations with this young woman and explain to her, like, you can't eat peanuts or nuts and then be around Jack. Like, that's that's something you have to be. I mean, it's just the things you have to think about. You cannot have peanut butter and kiss my son. Exactly. Please, because I, I don't want to think about having, you know, I don't want to be getting any phone calls saying that, you know, my son needed an EpiPen in your presence. Um, but yeah, it's it's like these considerations that so many families are dealing with, and and it's it can be very very scary. I I myself am not someone who buys into fear mongering. I'm not a fear based person, but my mind goes to the very first patient I took care of who died of anaphylactic shock, and it's not it's not pretty. So you know that's that's what I think about. Um, you know, trying to caution my now 17 year old who's very cavalier and you know doesn't think it's possible this could ever happen, and so. It's, it's interesting as a parent navigating all this, especially with a teenager that, you know, they generally think that their parents are the least intelligent individuals in the room. Like, I know that will come around, but but I hear that often enough where I kind of, mom, you're just being so, you know, you're being ridiculous. Yes, but it's because I love and care about you that I just want you to be thinking about those things. Of course, every teenager is invincible, uh, <clears throat> myself included. Um you know, you mentioned your background as an ER nurse and an NP, and, you know, I think we're at an interesting point. We, we have a health coaching program, and we see so many NPs signing up, and there's just this collective burnout, I think, for, I think for a lot of reasons, but I'm curious your take. Yeah, I, I'm not at all surprised because a lot of my NP colleagues and nurses will reach out and say, how, d- how did you get to where you are? Because that's what I want to do. Um, I was completely burned out. And this was 2016 when I left clinical medicine. A lot of it was because in uh, like, as an example, like critical care, ER medicine, cardiology, loved it in my 20s and 30s. But as I was getting a little bit older, I just didn't feel like I needed to prove myself. Like I, I was proving myself in those years but the onslaught of what is changing in medicine, we're, ex- we're expected to see more people for less reimbursement. Um, there are, there's less support, you know, when you're in a hospital situation. Um, people are just, you know, there's a lot of healthcare providers that are burned out. It's not just nurses. It's not just advanced practice nurses or docs or PAs or techs or cleaning personnel. And I think probably the last three years, a lot of people have left clinical medicine because they just feel like they can't do their job in the capacity that they want to, because we want to spend time with our patients. There's no one in medicine that doesn't genuinely love and want to help people. But when you feel so much constraint administrative, whether it's electronic medical records, whether it's a bean counter that's walking around and, you know, you know, shaking their finger at you and saying, you forgot to check this box and dot that I, and you're thinking to yourself, I, I just saved a patient and you're focused on like some little metric, which didn't impact patient care, but you have to check it off in order to have certification for something that, you know, doesn't really impact the providers or the patients at all. So it isn't at all surprising. And I feel like in a lot of different ways that medicine in the mid 1990s, late 1990s, when I started is very different than how it is now. I I have actually said to colleagues of mine, And I think, you know, some of the brightest people end up in medicine, you know, the people that are end up in critical care areas and ER medicine and cardiology and pulmonary critical care. I mean, there's every specialty has really bright people, but they're leaving because they feel so disconnected from being able to practice the art of medicine the way that they want to. And what ends up happening is there's this disconnect between providers and patients. The patients sense this disconnection, the providers sense the disconnection, 
And there's no quick fix. There's really no quick fix. So I'm seeing lots of my colleagues leave medicine in droves. They're either creating their own practices on their terms. So maybe they have a concierge practice. Maybe they're becoming a health coach. Maybe they are you know, becoming an entrepreneur because they are trying desperately to continue to serve others, but do it in a way that feels more authentic and doing it in a way that they're not working 24 seven. I know that during the pandemic, because I have a very specific skill set, um, local hospitals were reaching out to me and asking, could I um, come in and, and help with patients in the ICU? Could I round with the hospital of service? And I actually declined because I kept saying to my husband, once I step back in, I know what's going to happen. You know, I'm not one of those people who's not going to give 150%, but I also know what my burnout was like when I left. And I tell people all the time, I love the intellectual rigor of medicine, but I don't love in many ways what medicine has become. And I think patients feel the same way. I don't think that most patients feel per se that they're getting the kind of care that they want. And it's because our system is is so broken in so many different ways. That's why you see functional and integrative medicine really rising And we need all types of medicine. You know, if you're critically sick, you need traditional allopathic surgical intervention. Absolutely. I'm, I've even benefited from that. You know, a couple of years ago, I had a ruptured appendix and I have zero doubt had I not had the team that I had, um, it could have ended up being very different. But I think more often than not, my colleagues are burned out. They're frustrated. The patients are frustrated. And I feel like in many ways there has to be, at some point, there has to be some type of mediation. There has to be some improvement because the the current system is so broken and it's so focused on medical management. And by the medical management, I mean, you come in with high blood pressure on three separate occasions, you're going to get a medication. But what's the impetus for the blood pressure issue? Is it your insulin resistant? Is it because you've got a, a tumor on your adrenal gland? I mean, we aren't looking per se at those kinds of metrics. We're just, you know, we're just kind of checking the box. Okay, blood pressure is abnormal, medication back in in two weeks, follow up on labs if appropriate. And it's really that much time that clinicians have to make those kinds of decisions. And we wouldn't want it to be that way. We do want to spend more time um, actually getting to know our patients and really understanding what's the precipitant for bringing those symptoms in at that clinic visit. Or are you nervous? For anyone who's nervous, uh, this has happened to me. There have been times where I've been nervous and have gotten my blood pressure and it's been high. And I say, wait, that's high. Give me two minutes. And I'll do a little breath work and I, I'll watch my heart rate and they'll come down. They do it again. Boom. Normal. Yep. Well, that's called white coat hypertension. And so we would we would have certain patients that would be in their chart, white coat hypertension. We would send them home with a blood pressure cuff. We would make them check at home and inevitably their blood pressure was better. And I agree with you. Um, you know, even even that is an example that more often than not, I can't tell you how many patients would come to me in tears. They're like, I don't want to be on blood pressure meds. And I'm like, okay, time out. It has to be on more than one occasion, number one. Number two, if you tell me you're going through a divorce, a move, you've lost your job, there's some stressor, that's going to impact your your uh, you know, your autonomic nervous system. And that will absolutely have a net impact on your vital signs. So let's like let's think through this as opposed to reflexively offering up medication for every, you know, outlier piece of information. And that that's typically what ends up happening is, oh, you know, I have five minutes to see with this patient, they're going to get a prescription and I'm going to send them home. When if you had taken five minutes to listen to what's going on in their personal life, it would have given you some perspective. And maybe we bring this patient back in two days or a week, we recheck things, we reassess things. So when you decided to leave, there were certainly a lot of directions you could have gone, but you you chose to some degree, you wrote a book about intermittent fasting, became wildly successful. You have a TED talk. I think it's millions and millions of views. I'm curious why intermittent fasting for you? You know, you could you could have gone so many different directions. Yeah, I think it really started as a personal strategy that I was utilizing. So in, in 2015, I started intermittent fasting, but really it was the end of one. I was the typical early perimenopausal woman who had never struggled with weight loss resistance. And all of a sudden I was. And so it was very humbling. Here I am as a clinician, I'm telling my patients to do this, you know, these five things, and they're not working for me. And now I'm starting to realize there must be something more, more to what's going on at this stage of life than I had realized. And so I started with intermittent fasting for myself because I was weight loss resistant. And within a week or two, I remember saying to my husband, like, I'm not losing weight, but I feel really good. Like I have so much energy, so much, you know, clarity of thought. I feel amazing. And so uh, it then started to 
kind of ebb and flow into the work I was doing with patients and with clients. And, you know, it, intermittent fasting, I always say picked me, I didn't per se pick intermittent fasting. And so in 2018, I'm an introvert. And um, I decided to do a TED talk, because that seemed like a good thing to do, I was going to challenge myself as an introvert. And the rest is really history, I ended up doing two TED talks. But the second one that you're referring to was in March of 2019. And so for me, I, I think it was the right message at the right time. A lot of what I think I'm known for is taking you know, complicated concepts and making them tangible and accessible for everyone. And so I, I think that message really resonated because people are tired of gimmicks. They're tired of potions and pills and powders. And um, there's no other way to say it, like well-meaning entrepreneurs or fit pros that are out there convincing us that we have to buy the latest latest and greatest thing. Um, and yet I want people to, to actually be able to utilize strategies that they can use throughout their lifetime, as opposed to, you know, for six weeks to be able to lose X number of weight that they'll end up putting back on because they're so calorie restricted. And so that's really where it stemmed from. But I've always been interested in metabolic health, obviously, with my background in cardiology. Um, and for me, it was, in many ways, the missing piece of the puzzle, it made so much sense to me when I started doing it. And when I started talking to my patients about it, I'm like, I think everything we've been telling you is wrong, telling you to eat frequently, telling you to eat heart healthy grains, encouraging you to under eat on protein, not emphasizing how important it is to dial in on sleep and stress and lifting weights and all these other things. And so I, I, I look at it as I'm making up for many years of not knowing better, I would say know better, do better. And now I know better. And I want people to understand what they can do to harness much better health and it, irrespective of what age range you're in. Because I've got people messaging me that are in their 70s that started fasting and feel amazing. I've got younger you know, individuals that are using it cautiously as they should because they're younger, leaner, fitter, um, and then everyone in between. And I, I think it gives people hope that there are options out there that are not kind of the standard medical recommendations. And so how do you think about intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating in terms of <laughs> the parameters? How do you define it? Is it circadian? Is it 13 hours? Is it 16 hours? There's so many different ways people think about this. How do you define it? Yeah. So when I think about intermittent fasting, it's really eating less often and it's very bio-individual. It's very flexible. So I think of 12 or 13 hours of not eating as digestive rest. That should be the bare minimum for everyone. That should be what we recommend to everyone. And then from there, if you are, you know, transitioning from a standard American diet and being a couch potato, transitioning from there, going to maybe you you fast from dinner to breakfast, maybe that's 14 hours, and then you're slowly opening up your fasting window based on, you know, your own response to that. I, I think that kind of a sweet spot is 16 hours fasted, but for some people within a week or two of fasting, they can get there. And I think for individuals that are less metabolically healthy, less metabolically flexible, it may take them four, six, eight weeks. And that is not uncommon um, because they are just, they're, they're kind of metabolically deranged enough that their body isn't effective at utilizing different types of fuel. So intermittent fasting can be periods of time over 24 hours. It could be 16 hours, could be 18 hours, could be two days, kind of defining how many hours in which a day in which you're going to eat. And that could be six hours, eight hours, I usually recommend two meals in a feeding window per se, because I think that's important to be able to get to your protein need mats, needs met, certainly very important. But really as a starting place, it's really looking at what is the, the, the relationship between you and giving your body time for digestive rest, really important, grossly under supported, you know, when we're talking to our traditional kind of peers in medicine, we don't talk, we don't get a lot of training about nutrition. And we certainly don't get a lot of training about the net impact of meal frequency and food choices. But that's a good starting place. Eating less often, it's a little less triggering than saying fasting. There are people out there that they hear the word fasting, and they're like, no way, I can't do that. And I always say everyone can eat less often, even my teenagers who eat voluminous amounts of food can go 12 hours of digestive rest, they really can. It's amazing. And so how do you think about the timing of the first meal and the duration between meals. 
Um, so th there are two questions. So number one, I'm a fan of being aligned with circadian biology because that is what really works and resonates for me and for most of my patients. So this is eating earlier in the day. You might break your fast at 10 a.m. You might break your fast at 9.30 a.m. or 11 a.m. And usually a four to five hour time period between when you have your first meal and your second and because that's a time period in which you are really optimizing digestion and efficiency and things like the migrating motor complex, which helps to kind of optimize moving things. It's kind of like a street sweeper in your digestive system. It's kind of moving food forward, brushing away parasites and things that you've potentially ingested that don't belong. Four to five hours in between meals would be ideal. And this is so contrary to what we've taught patients for so many years. A lot of people completely... Um, they really struggle with like wrapping their head around that. But we know based on circadian biology, we are more insulin sensitive earlier in the day. So eating, you know, your first meal late morning, last meal later in the afternoon, understanding we don't want to be eating two to three hours before bed, understanding these circadian clocks that we have, not just in our brain, in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but also understand we have them throughout our body, especially the digestive system. So if you're eating at eight, nine o'clock at night in the winter, or fall when it gets darker earlier, um, you're really setting yourself up for a night of poor quality sleep. And for anyone that knows me knows I'm incredibly supportive and um, incredibly, um, I, I really prioritize sleep quality. So eating earlier in the day is more aligned with circadian biology. Obviously in summer when it stays lighter out, stays lighter longer, um, you can kind of play around with you know the time frame in which you're eating. But I do find for most individuals, they feel better and maybe, one of that's maybe that's one of the blessings of the pandemic is that for many of us, like our lives kind of shut down. And maybe um, I know for myself, my husband, and I realized like, gosh, we actually feel better when we eat earlier as opposed to later. Um, so giving yourself that opportunity. Now, I recognize there are probably people listening that are like, hey, I work shifts. That's not possible. I always say there's always a workaround. But if you follow along with circadian biology, um, and actually Sachin Panda has great studies and work around this area, really understanding that that's, that's the most optimal time to eat. Um, and then aligning your, your macronutrients, depending on who you are as an individual. I have plenty of friends in the health and wellness space who love to have you know carbs at dinner. I have other friends who prefer to have them earlier in the day, really depends on your insulin sensitivity and your metabolic health. But then also, you know, your sleep quality can play a role as well. So you mentioned macros and protein definitely needs to be part of this discussion. And if I think about the 16 hour window, you say at least four to five hour gap, okay, I can get two meals in. And so for some people that might work, but, but before I go to the, the three meal scenario, let, let's stay on the two with protein. How do you think about protein in terms of what I would say, think about it two ways. One is an individual who just wants to maintain their their lean muscle mass, and then someone who wants to grow their lean muscle mass. It's a great question. I think protein is probably the most important macronutrient. And if we look at the research, we know that as we get older, we actually need more protein and not less. So I'm a fan of Dr. Gabrielle Lyon's work. And you know she's a huge proponent of educating people that the RDA is a gross underestimation of, of what our, our, our needs are. So when I'm thinking about two meals a day, it's helping everyone understand that they need to have 40 to 60 grams of protein in that meal. Really important to understand because protein is... Um, not just about, you know, hitting, you know, getting those those caloric needs met, but also satiety signals. It's important for muscle protein synthesis. So, you know, if you read the research, it'll usually recommend at least 30 grams per meal. But I usually say I'm, you know, 120 pounds, I'm five foot three, I'm aiming for 60 grams in that first meal. Um, and that is achievable. Uh, but for people that are starting out with a lot less, that can be problematic. So at least, you know, 40 to 60 grams of protein with those two meals. Obviously, for people who are um, taller, bigger people, um, that their protein needs need to be met with more food than that, then they may be able to fit in a third meal. Now, I can assure you, if I if I took my active teenagers who in this are in this massive anabolic phase of their lives, they could easily fit three meals in an eight hour window. For me, I do really well with two. So a bit of it is experimentation. And typically, when I'm talking to people and we're talking about transitioning from standard American diet to, you know, slowly in working their way into fasting, it's the stop snacking is number one. Number two, it's not eating from dinner to breakfast. Number three is slowly opening up that fasting window. 
And then the, the next piece is really making sure when you have those meals, you're hitting those protein macros so that you're not hungry in between. If you get hungry in between your meals, that's okay. It's just reminding you that next time have more protein. Uh, or, you know, if you have a ribeye, you've got plenty of healthy fats in there, but maybe the next time if you're having a, a chicken breast or a piece of lean fish, maybe you have some avocado, maybe you have some nuts with that, although be careful with the nuts because they're delicious and they're easy to overeat like most healthy fats are, but really helping people understand that it's not just about the the vanity metrics or ch helping to change body composition. When I'm working with someone who's who's really trying to build lean muscle, I always remind them it's, you have to hit those protein macros, you have to you know, create enough stimulus. So you have to lift heavy things. And for each one of us, that might look a little different. And you have to have high quality sleep. And you can't build healthy, lean muscle without all three of those. Like you can't skimp on the sleep. You can't eat a garbage diet and think you're gonna be able to build healthy muscle. But I think it's very, very important to emphasize that most of what I used to tell patients was wrong in terms of representation about protein, how, how very, very important it is because sarcopenia is not a question of if, but when, um, and there's something called sarcopenic obesity, which is a fancy way of saying, as we are getting older, we are losing muscle mass and that is being replaced with fat adipose tissue, which is a highly inflammatory tissue. And the way to think about it, because I'm very visually oriented is young muscle is like filet. It's delicious, right? Very lean and delicious. And then as we get older, we start replacing muscle tissue with fat. And so ribeyes, good representation, lots of marbling, lots of adipose tissue that is coming through the muscular tissue. That's what starts to happen to our muscles. We don't want that to happen. We really genuinely want to work against kind of the normal biologic drive. If we aren't working against it, we will not only lose muscle mass, we'll lose insulin sensitivity. And so, so much of my work is helping people understand that what are the things that help with insulin sensitivity? Protein, intermittent fasting, lifting heavy things, all really critically important. But protein, I think, is really misunderstood. And I think there's there's certainly a, um, how do I say this? There's certainly an agenda right now trying to demonize the consumption of animal-based protein. So it's a it's a very emotional topic. We, we love we've had Gabrielle on the show. We've had Don Lehman, who I think is the authority on protein, who Gabrielle studied under. And you know it, the way I think about it, it's part of the longevity conversation. In that, one out of four people over the age of sixty five fall. If you fall once, you are twice as likely to fall again. If you fall and break your hip you have a 30 to 40% chance of dying within a year. And I'll just pause there because that's pretty scary. And it's not just, so if you think about like, okay, so why, why do you want to eat protein and, and do some sort of resistance training? One, it's to maintain or, or build your, your skeletal muscle mass, your lean muscle mass. And you know, there are a couple of things going on. So one, if you're about to fall, maybe if you're if you're doing some resistance training, you can balance and maybe grab something and be strong enough so you don't fall. Or if you do fall, you have the armor to break the fall. And it's not that breaking the hip kills you. It's which which it could. It's all the things you've seen this in hospitals. This happened to a dear friend of ours. You break the hip. You're in a hospital. Oh, you get an infection. There's a complication. You know, it's something else that goes on and to your point sarcopenia is is very real and even myself in my late 40s i i i told tell the story in, in our book you know i i didn't i never liked doing legs and the last time i did legs was in 1998 after you know weight training was not required anymore playing basketball in college i'm like I'll, I'll go to the gym but i'm not too i'm done with legs and then about a year ago i got in the scale and i'm much bigger i'm six foot seven and i, I i've always been around 200 pounds and all of a sudden i lost like five pounds i'm like what happened and i look in the mirror i'm like my ass is completely flattening and not like i don't care about the aesthetics i'm like my legs are disappearing <laughs> what is happening and so it's become a priority for me and it's it's the, the legs and my butt are coming back 
I've, I've shared with, with, with Gabrielle some of my progress of getting my muscle mass back. But to me, it was, it was eye-opening. I'm like, oh, my God, this, is, this has happened to me. My, my, my legs have started to evaporate. Over, I used to have basketball legs. They're gone. Now they're back. But it, it's scary. It, it really is. And it's interesting how many patients I took care of over the years who could not get from their bed to the bedside commode and off the toilet. They were in their 50s. And so, you know, I was always ordering physical therapy and occupational therapy in the hospital. But I, I, I think about my grandmother and I think about my aunts and, and I think about women I see in the gym that are really thin. I mean, they're thin, but there's no musculature. How many women are in my Pilates class, as an example, and they, they've lost so much muscle mass, they're just skinny. Don't talk about Pilates. They'll come after you. I know, but I, I love Pilates. I do Pilates, but I, but you know, it's funny. I do Pilates twice a week because I need I need the flexibility work, especially with the amount of lifting that I do. Um, but Pilates can be humbling, ha- be incredibly challenging. So I want to be clear about that. It can be very challenging. We, we, just to be clear to our Pilates friends listening, we still love Pilates. We yes, love Pilates. We love Pilates. But I agree with you that the way that our our muscles will change in response to the lack of stimulus, changes in hormones. And certainly for women, we're really at risk for this as we're losing estrogen and testosterone heading into perimenopause and menopause. And I just think a lot of people don't realize like sometimes what worked for you in your 20s and 30s is no longer working to your advantage in middle age and beyond. And so understanding that, you know, when we're listening to the experts, you know, whether it's um, Don Lehman or Gabrielle Lyon or others, that there's a lot to learn. Like I always say, I, I look at I look at the world from a view of curiosity. There's always something more for me to learn. And I certainly humbly am always learning. And I, I talked earlier about how I had this hospitalization in 2019. I lost 15 pounds in a week from being, a, being in a bed. And so I remind people like, if you don't, like if I had not been as healthy as I was, I think there would have been a different outcome but it took me a long time. I'm still not back to where I was four years later, still taking time to build that muscle back. So you don't want to be in a position where you have a hospitalization and you lose that much muscle mass because you're, you know, my body was catabolizing because I wasn't eating. Um, you don't want to be in a position where you're at a disadvantage because I recall finally understanding why patients were so weak after being in bed for a week or two. I'm like, oh, now I get it. But you have to have a good baseline so that you can rally and get beyond where you were. But so many of my patients didn't do well because they they didn't start from a healthy level and then they got sick and then they just kind of stand in, you know kept on this downward trajectory. And it becomes a lot more difficult the older you get. And just to come full circle, the why behind the protein is you need a certain amount and more specifically, you need enough leucine, which is an amino acid, so that two and a half grams to activate the muscle protein, to encourage muscle protein synthesis. Otherwise, the protein just goes to waste. So that's the why. Because so, in other words, if you want to build muscle, you need enough protein. Otherwise, you will not activate muscle protein synthesis and it won't happen. Also, I'll worth noting, you can't like protein your way into muscle. You still need to, it's still very critical to actually do the resistance training. Can't discount that. That matters a lot um and what's also interesting you mentioned your son i thought this was fascinating when we had layman on with kids essentially all the protein counts so like for us for me i need i need we i need the leucine to make it count the two and a half grams or roughly 30 grams or 40 depending on the leucine content and this is where animal protein skews much higher in leucine but for kids it doesn't matter it's all good yeah No, it's interesting. I have a 15 year old who was a competitive swimmer until he ended up at a high school that is kind of like college. So he's in a, he's in a top five public high school and it's amazing. It's an amazing opportunity. It's where he needs to be, but because his school is so demanding, he couldn't swim six days a week. And so he is now going to the gym and lifting. This kid has put on 14 pounds of muscle in the past four months. 14 pounds. It's because his, he's he's getting a little, well, I don't want to use the word obsessive because that sounds pejorative, but he is very conscientious. You know, he listens to, to Gabrielle Lyon and, and really, you know, leans into that and feels like she's a good resource for him. But understanding, you know, those protein macros that he's so conscientious about and the carbohydrates, healthy carbs, and, 
you know, using, you know, certain types of supplements, you know, for him, it's been, it's been amazing to see the progress that he has made, you know, being a swimmer, he was in tremendous and phenomenal um, aerobic and anaerobic conditioning, but now he's building muscle. And I'm just like, wow, that's amazing. I think a lot of our industry talks about what we can't eat and what we need to avoid. And so let's talk about what we can eat and what are the things you really encourage for someone who's listening who wants to make sure they're getting enough protein, that they're eating the right carbs, the right fat? What are some of the things they should enjoy? Yeah, I think that's such an important question. So obviously, I'm going to talk about, you know, kind of a wild approach, being open minded to different types of animal based protein, you know, during the, the pandemic, kind of as a challenge for the house, because there were a lot of things we couldn't do, we couldn't really go out to eat. You know, we started eating bison, we started eating elk, we started eating wild boar, in addition to, you know, the usual pork and beef and chicken and fish and shellfish and things like that. So protein variety, I, I think our bodies are really optimized when we don't get very food monogamous, meaning we eat the same, like I always say monogamy is a good thing, but we want to, but in terms of food monogamy, we want to have some variety. That's important. Um, so that combined with brightly pigmented fruits and vegetables, I don't demonize fruit. I think if you are metabolically healthy, you can get away with a piece of fruit, you know, to, you know, one piece of fruit to three types of vegetables. I think there, there needs to be more of an emphasis on vegetables um, and having a variety of brightly pigmented things. So in our house, we've got berries and bananas and my kids really like mango and and they can eat all those things and, and not have to worry about it. Lots of um, some, even some bitter greens because they're really good for digestion, whether it's arugula, radicchio, freeze, I think bitter, bitter greens are important. And then kind of rounding things out with healthy fats and depending on the individual, um, whether it's plant-based fats or animal-based fats, so lard, tallow, duck fat, if you tolerate those things, that's wonderful. Um, or if you do better with olive oil and coconut oil and avocados and nuts and seeds and things like that, butter, ghee are all really nice options. But again, having options, not making it so that you eat the same chicken, broccoli and white rice, you know, every day, three times a day, your body really genuinely does better having some variety and then encouraging people to try things that are new. Like we have some wins in our house and sometimes we have losers. Like we've learned we don't like parsnips and it's winter time. And, and I always say like, let's try a rutabaga Let's try a parsnip. Well, the parsnips were not popular and that's okay. I always say to my kids, better to, you know, go to the farmer's market or look and see what's seasonal. Try those things out. Um, I think it's really important. The only two things that I would say, like I kind of give caution and this is why I think label reading is important. Um, number one are seed oils and number two is, is fructose or high fructose corn syrup in particular. But beyond that, I, I usually say shop the periphery, focus in on those things first um, I think it's fine to have like an occasional treat. You know, some people like really high quality ice cream or they want high quality dark chocolate. I think that's fine as long as you can curtail your portions because it's very easy. I, I think about the teenagers in my house who can blow through half a gallon of ice cream like it's nothing, um, you know, versus, a you know, two ounces of high quality dark chocolate, I think are, are certainly reasonable. And then just deciding what works best for you. I'm big about hydration. Water is very important. I'm a huge proponent of electrolytes. Um, of course, with my background in cardiology, I get I got to see over the years what happens when people are clinically dehydrated, even healthy people, too much alcohol, too much stress, not enough magnesium in our soils. Um, so I really like electrolytes. And that's usually a good kind of starting point. If people tolerate dairy, great. Full fat, organic or raw is going to be you know your best option. Um, there's certainly tons of raw cheeses that are out there. If you have the ability to have raw milk, I think that's great. Or A2 milk. If you don't tolerate dairy, um, there's certainly, you know, coconut milk can be a nice option or clean nut milks. Um, obviously not in my house, but Malk is a good brand um, of nut milk, high quality, not full of gums and fillers. And then kind of round things out uh, from there. But I, I do think it's important to have bitter foods. I've started talking more about that, whether it's from vegetables or, you know, black tea, green tea, plain coffee, because uh, it sends important signals to our body about either fat oxidation or digestion, um, et cetera. But I think our, our palates are so sensitized to sweet that we just automatically reject it. I get lots of DMs, people saying, I can't have black coffee. You can, there's ways around it. Same thing like it's, you know, it can be an adjustment to have a bitter tea. I don't love drinking tea, but I do have tea every day because it, has, it sends important information to my body. And so I've learned to ice it 
and then I drink it with a straw and that works really well. So there's lots to love about your about your food philosophy. Something something for everyone. And and personally, I love that you mentioned you have bananas because I feel like bananas are getting a bad rap. A lot of people have tried the the CGMs where they're getting a a big spike after a banana. Bananas are great though. Well, you know what's funny? I'm weird. I like bananas when they go from being green to just barely a little bit yellow. So it's really like it's it's like essentially a less ripened banana. I've always been that way. My whole family thinks it's strange. I'm like, you don't understand. It's like there's a very narrow, it's like an avocado. Like there's a very narrow window in which I'm like happy about that banana. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, there's nothing better. And the irony is I've worn CGMs for the past almost two years. And I don't get a massive blood sugar response to the banana, but I do from a plantain, which makes zero sense to me. I love plantains, but plantains do not like me. But I, I think, unfortunately, fruit has gotten demonized. And I just remind people, like, I know on days I lift heavy, especially legs, that's when I will probably will have some sweet potato. I'll have some banana. Um, and I don't, I don't have any problems with that. You know, deplete your glycogen and you know, give you a little bit more back, but I'm also insulin sensitive. So I'm able to do that. But if you were an individual that was not metabolically healthy, insulin resistant or diabetic, I would caution, I would probably say, let's have some berries and let's, you know, let's have a lower, lower glycemic um, carbohydrate. Let's try that. Cause I'm, I'm a fan of people understanding that there are healthy carbs that can be consumed. Um, there are options that I like a little less cause they're a little more processed um, but I, I do find that that kind of methodology works well for most people because they don't feel like they're being deprived. You mentioned salt and when you go heavy lifting, what I found, I know we're, we're both fans of Element. Uh, I need a lot more salt when I work out, especially living in Miami where it's warmer. I, I need a lot more salt. I, I need a lot more magnesium. Yes. And it's interesting. I just recently learned that I have a mild case of dysautonomia. Um, I was shocked because in cardiology, we always saw these severe manifestation of POTS. So postural orthostatic hypotension where people would just, they couldn't, their autonomic nervous system couldn't properly regulate their blood pressure and pulse. And when I was out in Denver this past weekend, I was shocked at how much more electrolytes I needed to be at altitude, so mile high needed more electrolytes to be at altitude, needed more hydration. And so I so agree with you, especially when I travel, I travel with a little thing of Redmond salt and I salt, my kids think they're like, mom, you're just, you're so weird. You walk around with salt. And I said, I need to salt my food. I actually crave salt. And I think part of it is my body's way of trying to better kind of acclimate to wherever I am. So yes, I agree with you. And I, I think so many of us walk around clinically dehydrated, we don't even realize it. And uh, I think it's so, so important. But yeah, electrolytes are a large part of, of my daily my daily routine. So something else you mentioned, you talked about the ribeye versus filet. And I've also you've also spoken about your tolerance with fat, which I think is interesting. And a lot of people may not realize they have a similar issue. Can you talk a moment about that? Yeah. So I've, I've come to find that I do better with uh, plant-based fats. And that's kind of been... I, th I think for many years, I didn't really understand why I felt nauseous and sick. And I have a healthy gallbladder. It's not an issue with my gallbladder. It is part of my innate bioindividuality that I do best with lighter plant-based fats. So I'm going to do better with coconut oil, avocados, nuts and seeds. Um, I can tolerate a little bit of ghee or a little bit of butter. But if I were to have, and as an example, I was in a French restaurant in New York um, pre-pandemic, and I had like a great steak and they had offered these duck fat fries and I was nauseous for hours. I just don't do well. It's almost like I have a brick in my stomach. And so I've come to learn that, you know, for some of us, it's just, it's too heavy of a fat for the same reason why I'm going to pick leaner protein. Um, I'm going to do better with leaner fish, leaner protein. I've been that way my whole life. And so there are people like I have two, two, uh, two out of four of us in our house could do ribeyes and salmon, and they have no problems. Two of us don't. And so I think it's just this innate understanding of our own physiology and it has nothing to do with poor quality gallbladder function or poor quality bile because I eat, I eat a lot of bile supportive foods. It's just what works innately for my body and what works best for me. You know, I think something that's important to remind people of, it's where you started, the power of the N of one. I think we look to so many studies, we look to all the experts and look, there's a lot of sage advice out there and there's definitely lots to learn from some of these studies, but ultimately we're all N of ones. 
and we need to listen to our bodies and look at our own labs. Someone may look at a rib ribeye and their cholesterol goes, their lipid panel goes through the roof. Another person could eat five ribeyes a day and it doesn't matter. I mean, that's an exaggeration, probably, but yeah, I think don't underestimate the power of the N of one. Yeah. And that's something that I've really learned, um, especially over the past seven years, you know, when I'm supporting different women from different parts of the United States and outside the U.S., just the acknowledgement that teaching everyone to lean into their body's intuition. The irony is, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm working with this new functional medicine provider who I think is probably one of the brightest physicians I've ever met. Coincidentally, who happened to be in the city that I that, that I moved to during the pandemic. And we were talking about um, dysautonomy. And I said, I don't have that. And so we did a couple tests and I failed this NASA sit test and a few other things. And my blood pressure, instead of going down, went up and quite high. I was very symptomatic. And he said, Cynthia, when you started telling me that you crave electrolytes, you crave water, he's like, I think it's your body's way of trying to fill in the gaps. I think that if you hadn't been as conscientious about um, your nutrition and your hydration and your electrolytes, that you might have become symptomatic much earlier. So I hope that people, when they listen to our discussion, they understand that there's no one size fits all for anyone. And unfortunately, that's what we've been telling patients for years. Like every patient with high blood pressure needs X drug. Every patient who has PCOS needs this therapy. So the, the, the beauty of the N of one is so important. And yet we don't talk to people enough about it. And that's why I think flexibility in, in our nutritional ideas and flexibility with if we choose to fast or not fast, but understanding that we have to be our own best detectives. We have to be our own best N of one and just not buying into the everyone has to do the same thing. I just don't think that's the case. And working with people that can help facilitate that. I'm curious, who is the functional medicine practitioner? Aaron Hartman. Don't know. Yeah, they call him the medical detective. He's like, uh, he's put things together that no one ever has. And I, I think I've always had great providers, but um, I, I just, I walked out of his office and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, I can't believe he put all that together. Oh, wow. So, Something else in, in the conversation with maintaining lean muscle mass, resistance training, is creatine. You launched a, a creatine powder. You're a fan of creatine. I'm a fan of creatine. And I feel like creatine has made a comeback and crossed over to women because I think creatine had had a reputation for being something that only muscle head men would use in the gym, but not the case. So let's talk about creatine. It's one of the best researched supplements that's out there. About a year ago, I started using creatine and I was noticing that, you know, I'm, I'm a middle-aged woman, but I was in the gym. I'm able to be build lean muscle. I'm able to increase my weight week to week, which is important for me. I'm super competitive with myself. So I'm like, when I'm noticing that, I'm like, okay, I'm seeing more muscle definition, I'm seeing progression in the gym. I'm definitely challenging myself. And it's understanding that women innately make 70 to 80% less. We have less 70 to 80% less creatine stores than men, which helps us understand why it is so important to supplement with creatine. And it's not just about muscle mass. It's understanding that it can be integral in sleep quality in brain health and cognition, understanding that even in a woman's menstrual cycle, there can be times when they need more creatine versus less. And there's good research to suggest that perimenopausal and menopausal me women in particular have more creatine needs at that stage of life, much like we were talking about this muscle protein synthesis, this accelerated muscle loss with aging, understanding that this is something that, that individuals, men and women can use throughout their lifetime. And so, you know, for me, um, when I looked at the bro science, because of course, you know, my perspective was, oh, pre people, you know, load up with creatine, they're using anabolic steroids. That was my memory of it 25 years ago. And then understanding that if you aren't using loading doses, you know, and it's three grams a day for women, or, you know, five grams a day for men and or vegetarians or vegans, because you won't get enough from your diet. And let me be clear, you can't get enough from your diet, unfortunately, because I've had people message me and they'll say, I'm just going to get it from my meat. I'm like, well, if it was that easy, that would be great. But that actually, that's not the way that it works. So helping people understand that if you're taking the recommended doses based on study research, you can have some pretty incredible results. And so, um, you know, from my perspective, I'm all about muscle health and brain health. And I think it can be instrumental in, in helping with both of them. But lots of solid research, number one. 
Um, number two, if you're using it, the recommended doses, people don't have all the bloating. You know, that was one of the things I was hearing. People were so bloated. And I'm like, well, it's creatine monohydrate. What do you think it's doing to the muscles? It's hydrating the muscles. So if you're taking large doses of it, it would not be surprising if you feel puffy or bloated. But uh, the feedback has been really great. And I'm, I'm glad that you have a shared uh, appreciation and, and love for it as well. Well, I'm all about building lean muscle, my, my race to build lean muscle mass. So I am all about creatine. So I'm curious, what's interesting to you right now in terms of something that's maybe on the cutting edge or some science that's early in developing? What are you paying attention to? Um, you know, right now I am leaning into things that are helpful for sleep because so many of my female patients and clients struggle with sleep and that can be related to a lot of different things. So looking at different types of supplements that can be helpful, um, obviously some things that can be helpful for people that are getting older or sometimes replacing hormones. And that's a whole separate conversation. Um, but things that I'm seeing are helpful for sleep. Myo inositol is one. Um, L-theanine and GABA and kind of playing around with those. Um, I would say the other thing that has kind of been on my radar is, and I may mispronounce this, urolithin, which is a derivative of, yeah, so it's mitochondrial support because I love everything about um, supporting the mitochondria, you know, upregulating mitophagy, autophagy. Um, those are probably the two things that are, or the, the two categories that are kind of on my radar right now. That are definitely, I, I'm definitely doing more research. I'm kind of down the rabbit hole right now to see, you know, how to utilize these things in clinical practice, um, see what the research is showing. Cause I, I like to be very evidence based. I like to be able to point people to research that want that kind of detail um, and to feel comfortable and confident that recommendations I'm making are going to be beneficial. Amazing. Cynthia, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.